All right, can everyone hear me? I assume. Yep. All right. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this week's um, public lecture series, Montana Tech Pu Public Lecture Series, hosted by the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. Um, happy in this week to introduce our two speakers, uh, Kim Stedman, Systems Engineer for the Mars 2020 rover and operations lead for the Sherlock instrument, and Dr. Sarah Milkovich, uh, planetary geologist and systems engineer also for the Mars 2020 rover, um, both coming, us, coming to us from um, NASA JPL. And I'll hand it over to them to present on Perseverance Rover's early adventures in Jezero Crater Mars. Take it away. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for inviting us to uh share our share our adventures over the last year plus um in in uh with all of you um so yep. let me get this set up for advancing there we go we have been exploring mars for decades with um with robots uh, and we've been observing mars for even longer uh, with telescopes and and always this question of could Mars have had life has always sort of captured the imagination from uh, from science fiction authors to early scientists. Um, and it's been a sort of a long, hard road to really investigate that question. Um, so here is just the fleet of, of, of robotic scientists since the 70s with Viking, but um, our exploration of Mars goes back to the, the even earlier into the 60s with Mariner. Um, and we are here at Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover. So I wanna orient you a little bit because unlike me and Kim, you probably don't spend your time thinking about Mars all the time. Mars is the next planet out from the sun. Um, it's a little smaller than the earth, but it's bigger than the moon. And it's very, very cold. So I know that this time of year, you're probably thinking, you know, just you're experiencing super cold temperatures. Uh, and that's true, especially compared to us here in Southern California, but you have nothing on Mars. So uh, Mars gets down to negative 284 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. Um, so Mars today is a very cold desert. Uh, liquid water is not stable on the surface. Um, the atmosphere is very, very thin. It's, it's about 100 times less dense than the Earth's atmosphere. So this is a picture taken of the surface of Mars from the Curiosity rover. And um, you know, if you've ever been to the southwestern US, um, you know, maybe the Mojave Desert, uh, maybe Joshua Tree, you could just imagine photoshopping some yuccas in there and this would look totally like that part of the world. Um, however, we've, from all of our analysis of Mars, both from orbit and on the ground, um, we see evidence for large quantities of water in the past. So uh, these are uh, orbital photos of just giant outflow channels. Um, and there's, you can see the little scale bar there is 20 kilometers. So we believe that while Mars today is very cold and dry, Mars yesterday was warmer and wetter. Now, how, how much, how, what did we mean by yesterday? Well, true to geology, uh, we're talking about 3.6 billion years ago. Um, so we know from this fleet of, of studies um, from the chemistry of the rocks, from the shapes of the rocks, um, uh, we know that 3.6 billion years ago, Mars had a thick atmosphere. It had lots of liquid water in various places. It had um, all the elements to make it habitable. Why is that such a compelling thing? Why is that so compelling? Um, well, 3.6 billion years ago, Earth was very different from what it is today as well. And actually ancient Earth and ancient Mars we think we're very similar to each other. Not only that, but that 3.6 billion years ago timeframe is, 
is when we think life started on the earth. Some of the, the oldest evidence for, for life on, on earth was about, is about 3.5 to 3.6 billion years old. Um, so the idea here is if life could have started on earth and in those conditions and Mars had similar conditions, why couldn't life have started on Mars as well? Um, so that's what we're really all about. We're, go, we're about going to Mars and looking for uh, the evidence, looking for any evidence of ancient life. Now, what should we look for? Um, well, we like to joke about, uh, in, in a lot of engineering meetings, we'll joke about trying to find the dinosaur bone on Mars. But of course, everything that we think of as a classic fossil is actually less than 650 million years old. Um, and so we're not looking for bones of any kind. We're not looking for leaf impressions of any kind. We're looking for what we call microbial biosignatures. So the ancient, all, the, all the, the most ancient form of life for billions of years, it was just microbes on the earth. So that's what we should go look for on Mars as well. That is a super tricky question. Uh, how do you recognize a, micro a microbe in 3.6 billion year old rocks on another planet using a rover when you don't have a laboratory with you. Um, well, so we're going to look for what we call these biosignatures, so subtle patterns in the chemistry of the rocks, in the shapes of the rocks. We need lots of lines of evidence that come together to tell us that these patterns uh, could be formed in the rocks due to biology instead of geology. Um, so that picture there, I should mention, that's a slice through a stromatolite. And if you are not familiar with a stromatolite, that's when you have a mat of algae, essentially, that traps dirt, and then more algae and bacteria grow, and then more dirt is trapped. And you slowly build up this kind of dome-shaped um, deposit that this is then you slice, you've, we, this is a slice through the middle so you can see that structure. So that structure, there's the there's shapes, the shape of that structure and then the variations in chemistry in that structure are part of what comes together and tells us um, that that this is a stromatolite. And, and that's what the, the oldest, the oldest clear signs of life on earth are these ancient stromatolites. So that's what we're hoping to go find. Um, and this is our rover that we, uh, this is Perseverance. This is the Mars 2020 rover. Um, we have a suite of instruments that we will introduce you to as we go along through this talk. Um, but first I'm gonna call out Cam z which is our, our, um, our cameras on the top of the mast. Um, and you will, a lot of the initial pictures you will see are from Cam z or from some of our engineering cameras that help us navigate around on the surface of Mars. Um, we are about a 500 person international science team. Um, so, so several of these instruments were put together um, by folks in France, in Spain, and in Norway. And then we also have scientists who are all over the world. Um, and we all come together much like we're doing now on via you know, web sharing and phone calls to figure out how we're going to operate this thing. Um, I do want to call out that this is this is a big rover. This is you know it's about the size of a SUV, but it still can't carry. We can't carry the types of instruments that you would want to do to make really definitive biology analysis with. And so part of what we're doing is we are drilling rocks and placing them in core, placing cores of rocks in tubes. Eventually, placing those tubes on the surface of Mars. Um, so that hopefully a future mission will come pick them up and bring them back to Earth for study in, in laboratories here on Earth. And so um, if any of you students in the audience, you may get to someday work with these samples. So that's our rover. And we had to think about where are we going to send this rover that we're, going, we're looking for rocks that we can tell from, from orbit there's a good chance that we had a, an ancient habitable environment that could record these biosignatures that we're talking about. And we picked this place called Jezero Crater. Um, so this is a topography map. Blue is low and yellow is high. And um, you can see the shapes of the surface. We've got a big impact crater 
uh, we've got a dry riverbed, this inlet valley coming into the crater. And then we have an outlet valley. We have this outflow channel coming out of the crater. And we have this, this very distinct shape right at the inlet valley um, called the delta. And it was this delta that really drew us to this place. Um, so here's another view of the delta of Jezero crater sort of from the side. Um, this uh, just sort of screams that water, liquid water was here. Um, there, there was, we had a dynamic environment of a river flowing into a lake. Um, and we know on Earth, this is a picture of a delta in Alaska, we know on Earth that river deltas are habitable environments. So that we were like, this is very exciting place to go. Let's go there. And I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Uh, do you have anything to say before the video, Kim, or should I just play the video? No, just that looking at Jezero Crater before it was selected as a site, everyone thought by far it was the most difficult landing site to actually drive a rover in. And naturally, that's where we went. Yay! Yay! So yeah, <laughs> that we can play the video. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver, where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Charge. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Catch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. We are starting. So yeah, that was the first time we'd actually ever seen um, the, the sky crane maneuver actually occur. This is the first time we had cameras, we could watch it. And you can't simulate it end to end on Earth. 
So when we got back those videos, everybody was very excited. So where did we land? We landed in uh, where the little, the little star is, and we were a little further away from the Delta than we had actually hoped, but we were in a very safe space and it was named the Octavia E. Butler landing site, which thrilled all of us. Okay, next. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. <clears throat> okay, here's one of our first HasCam images from uh, where we landed. And you can see is this is a wonderful place to land your rover. There are no big rocks. It's very kind of a dull looking place, which for us engineers, that's what we really like to send our rovers because it's very safe for them. So for a landing site, this couldn't have been more perfect. And uh, next. And so the rover has been on a long trip once she actually gets to Mars. You know, we, we, we took our rover, which we built with all the love that we could throw into her here at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. We flew her to Florida, put her on a rocket, which shook her up violently while we were, she was being launched. And then she was in space for about seven months and then she went through that landing. So now we have to make sure we've got a long journey. We have to make sure everything works. We didn't break anything. Like when you check your luggage, when you get it back, you hope everything's you know, still working. So that's what we wanted to do was check out to see if everything was still good. And, and we had to unpack because some things had to be kind of latched down for the rough ride that we we're gonna send her on. So the first thing we do is look around with uh, our Z cam, the mass cam Z, to make sure that everything looks okay. And then, so you can see the deck of the rover and the big white thing up on the top, that's the pixel instrument. And the little bubble thing next to it, that's our gas dirt removal tool, which we call GDIRT. Next. And then we start to release things. We released the launch lock that we had on our arm and deployed the arm and you know, spun the turret to make sure that everything still works. And you can also see the middle part of that big turret on the end of the arm is our drill that's going to collect all of our core samples. Next. And then we had to drive because what's a rover if she doesn't drive? So the first thing we do is we have six wheels. I only showed three here. And so we did wheel wiggles and, and looked at all the video of the wheel wiggles to make sure everything is working as it should. And next, and then we drove. And uh, we drove like, you know, just about a hundred or so feet. We didn't drive very far for the first drive just to prove that everything could work. And then as we turned around and looked, uh, the, the light colored area right there is the scour from the rocket that uh, landed the rover. And so there's some of our first tracks that we ever made on Mars with this rover and the scour mark. Okay, next. So um, what Sarah didn't talk about, except briefly, was you know we have all these wonderful complex instruments, but the most complex thing I think we have ever sent anywhere, besides the James Webb Telescope, is this sampling and caching system. And so uh, during the landing, uh, there was a protective cover on the bottom of the sampling and caching system that we had to to drop, and then it had another another door that uh, we needed to open. And so the one on the right is actually the Watson camera looking up underneath the rover at a mirror that allows us to look up into the sample and caching system. And on the left, you can see the upper door to the bit carousel being opened. Next. And while we're, you know, testing out all of our engineering things, like does the arm work, does the caching, can we get the into the sample and caching system? We're also testing some of our instruments. And this is our Watson image, our Watson imager. Um, it's uh, the next generation of the Mars hand lens imager that flew on Curiosity. And so this is what we call a Z-stack, just trying to get closer and closer and closer and taking all these beautiful images. And so whenever we want to see something up close on Mars, we use Watson. And the Watson's at the end of the arm sitting next to Sherlock, of course, because Sherlock cannot go anywhere without Watson. Next. And then after we did our checkout, we had our first round of checkouts to make sure everything was OK. We had this passenger that we took with us, the Ingenuity helicopter. And how do you get a helicopter to Mars? You just attach it to the bottom of your rover, of course. And so during landing, there was a debris shield that protected the uh, Ingenuity helicopter. So we had already dropped that. And we took about five days because each image that you see is taken on a different day. And so we had, to, we had this whole process, release launch lock, swing the, the Ingenuity down, release the legs, and then charge the battery to full and then deploy the helicopter. And we really just dropped her on Mars and drove straight over and then turned around to look at her to make sure she was still there. And, uh, and then we hadn't tipped her over, which we didn't think we would, but you never know. So next. So then of course, you know, you've dropped the first little helicopter on another planet. What are you gonna do? We can take a selfie. And so there's our beautiful Rover, nice and clean. She'll never be that clean again. Uh, looking over at her brand new friend, Ingenuity. Next. 
So Ingenuity is a technology demonstration mission and she was uh, slated to do five flights. And so this is her first flight. And so because it is the first, you know, powered flight, except for, you know, they always say this is the first powered flight on another planet. They forget about that sky crane landing us with its rockets. But anyway, other than that, this is the first powered flight on another planet. And it's a very simple flight. Just go up about 12 meter or 12 feet, uh, do a little turn and then land. But that was amazing. And it was also amazing that the mass cam Z could get this fabulous, fabulous video. And because uh, the exact takeoff time was not 100% certain and that we could get this for the uh, press conference that happened the very next day. So a lot of people spent a lot of time doing that. So we were all thrilled that Ingenuity has successfully flown. Next. So Ingenuity flew uh -huh, right through her first five demonstration flights. And then, it, then she got an extension, a mission extension. And so she became, instead of a technology demonstration, she became an operations demonstration. So what she's been doing is she's been skipping ahead of the rover to look at areas that we can't see with the rover. Like she flew over South Seta, this little, um, area that you see on the right where she did the, the crossover. That was a, an area that's very interested, interesting, but from the science point of view. And so they want a closer look at it. And we can't fly there because you see those little ripples. We would look like that picture you saw from uh, Curiosity with the wheels digging into the dirt. So we sent her across. And, and then she looked at another couple of places that the, the scientists thought were interesting to see if, are they interesting enough for us to actually send the rover over there? And then she did this toe dip up into South Seta to make sure that to get images so that when we later drove the rover there that the rover planners could pick a safe path. And so now uh, she's headed back. She's up there to the right, close to where we uh, actually started out. And so she's going to skip ahead of the rover and get up to the Delta and then uh, do some scouting for us up there. And so far she's done 18 flights. The 19th is uh, coming in sometime in the next week. Next. And she has two cameras. She has a black and white nav camera for navigation, and she has a color camera. And in several of her uh, images, she's caught an image of our rover, which, you know, this is the closest we've got a, a, an image from our ro of our rover that wasn't taken by the rover itself. And so in the top left, you can see the rover there, and you can see the little foot of ingenuity. Next. Oh, you guys talk about weather. OK. Um... So uh, some of our one of our instruments is a weather station called Meta that was um, contributed by the by our team from Spain, um, and it's taking weather. It's taking all sorts of measurements. It's a whole bunch of sensors all around the rover, and it it takes measurements every day. Um, and so you can see we are currently in late summer in at Jezero Crater. Uh, this was the the weather from earlier this week and a little bit of last week, uh, the high was 12 and the low is negative 111. And frankly, when you get down to those temperatures, I don't think it really matters what units you're in at that point. Um, but you can always keep an eye, this website is, is one where you can always go and see what the most recent weather download has been. Um, we also have an instrument called MOXIE uh, that has been running from time to time. Um, so if you've seen The Martian, you know that one of the um, one of the big challenges for human potential human exploration of Mars is needing oxygen. And it's not just to breathe, although astronauts breathing is nice, but it's really for launching, uh, having a launch vehicle to bring the astronauts back home. Um, that takes thousands of kilograms of oxygen that we don't want to have to bring from Earth to Mars. So we want to figure out: can we use uh, can we use the carbon dioxide that is Mars's that's you know 99% of Mars's atmosphere ish? Um, can we use that to make oxygen? Um, so MOXIE is an experiment to see how that works. Um, it's basically like running a fuel cell in reverse. And it's um, it managed, this is from, I think, the first or second run. Um, and it produced about 
a little over five grams of oxygen, which after about an hour of operation, so that's enough to keep an astronaut healthy for about 10 minutes. Um, but the idea is that we want to know how how things work on Mars. They always work slightly differently than we expect. So we want to know um, how will this technology work? How will it not work? How will it break so that by the time we make one set that humans actually rely on, we're pretty solid and confident in our engineering. Um, so as we've came, sort of came to the end of all the checkouts that Kim was talking about, um, we really ramped up the science investigation. So we landed on the crater floor of Jezreel and we thought, do we make a beeline for the Delta? No, let's stop. Let's stay here for a bit. Um, these are likely the oldest rocks that we're going to find in Jezreel crater. So let's get to know them. They can tell us about the history of this crater before the Delta. Um, and we can also help us understand uh, if the lake in Jezero was a single lake or if there were a series of lakes followed by dry periods um, and just get to know, you know, the context for the Delta better. So we decided to drive down from Octavia E. Butler landing site down and to explore this green box. Um, this sort of mitten shaped feature here, um, Kim mentioned, we is this giant sand sea called Seta. Um, and we're so we're very interested in why is it different from the, the material, the, the crater floor immediately outside of it. Um, we want to know a lot about what's going on around here, uh, get to know it. The, the challenge that Kim mentioned about the sand dunes, um, you know, we, we can't, the helicopter the helicopter really showed us we cannot just drive across SETA. We have to go around SETA. But we also thought that getting down to the SETA South area, we could kind of we could sneak a little bit in and investigate the rocks of SETA. Um, really, it's some nice exposures in between the giant sand dunes down here before heading back up and driving around it to get up to the delta. So, um, so that's what we did, and that's what we've been doing uh, since landing. We're coming up to a year since landing, um, and as we got start, so so we we wanted we want to be able to do to when we're driving between places that are interesting, we want to drive as much as possible and as fast as possible. Um, and Kim is going to talk about uh, some of the ways that we're doing that for this rover. Well, yeah, one thing that we have, and we had it on Curiosity too, is something called auto navigation. When you tell the rover that you want to go from point A to point B, and then you let her decide exactly how she's going to get there. And so what we did was we pointed her to an obstacle that she could easily drive over, but we told her if she couldn't drive over it, we lowered her tolerances, and then we set her off. And as she drives along, she builds her own map. Here she goes. She's taken images, and now she herself has built what we call the world map. And then she looks for a safe way to go. And the, the gray paths that she's forming are safe. And so she went around our little obstacle. And uh, this is what we call AutoNav. And she can build the world and uh, drive onto it and uh, stay safe without us having to uh, micromanage every turn of her wheels. And at the end, she turns for calm so she can talk to us. So next. So yeah, so this is thinking while driving. That's odd, onboard auto navigation system. What it does is allow us instead of when the rover planners have to pick and choose and plan every turn of the wheels, you know, not this way rolling, but this way, then uh, we can go 30, 40 meters. But then when we have auto nav, we can go 100, 200 meters. And so it really allows us to get places that the scientists are interested in a lot faster and a lot fewer sols, a lot fewer days. We call a day on Mars a sol. I don't know who came up with that, but I like it. And uh, so that's how we do auto nav. And then now that we've tested auto nav, we're back to sampling. So one of the scary, scary things that we have to do with sampling is we have to sort of, we have to take the arm and literally plug it into the uh, bit carousel so that we can change out the bits because we have a bit on the, on the end of the drill that allows us to take a sample core. And then we also have a different bit that allows us to abrade. And so this was the first time that we ever actually tried that and uh, plugged into the rover, which was very scary because Curiosity has been on Mars nine years and has never traded out her bit because we're all frightened to do it. But now we've done it many times. So this was the first time we did that. And next, 
And another thing that we had to test out was inside the sampling and caching system, we have a way to seal the sample tubes and image, image that to make sure that it actually happened. And so the first thing we did with the interior uh, sampling caching system is seal a witness tube. And so when we get this tube back, this will show us uh, what kind of contamination we got inside the tubes um, by landing and then driving around. And so it's sort of a witness to tell, this is the cleanest tube you're ever gonna see. And so this is our cache cam uh, looking inside the tube and then capping it and then sealing it, which all worked fabulous. And since we had to change out our bits, um, when we launched, uh, if you don't have a bit in your drill, you just have a hole. And we did not want all that dust and rocks thrown up by our Mars landing engines to get inside and contaminate our beautiful sampling system. And so we launched with a launch bit is what we called it. And so to keep the drill happy, we uh, to keep all the sampling that we we're gonna do uh, after we, we landed, we went ahead and dropped this bit because if we use this bit to do an abrasion and did a Sherlock or Watson or a pixel science on it, then we would be using a contaminated bit and we could see things, fascinating things that we actually took with us from, from Earth. And so we went ahead and dropped this bit. Uh, the funny part is we dropped it on uh, the exact spot that Sherlock really wanted to do some science. And there was a protracted long discussion and argument about whether we could do it or not. And then a rubber planter finally uh, entered the conversation and says, are you talking about that target that we dropped the bit on? And then we're like, uh, I guess we are. So anyway, so we dropped our bit and so that we could put a brand new one on that was clean and uh, so we could start doing science. Next. So we now had gotten to, um, to really a, a nice location. We have these flat exposures of rocks that, um, uh, we can see a bunch of the different kinds of rocks we've been seeing on our drive from Octavia E. Butler landing uh, down to here. Um, and we've gotten through our engineering checkouts to a point where we are ready to try using the drill. We're ready to try abrading and drilling. Um, so there's a couple different, there's, you can see these flat, what we started calling paver stones here. And we thought, great, let's, uh, let's, get to know this place better. Um, so we named our workspace Guillaume and you can see uh, what, we're, what we're looking at. We, we, we take, the, uh, take the abrading bit and we make our first abrasion on Mars and this is what it looked like. Um, and one thing that I find really fascinating listening to all the members of the science team as we were analyzing this, just the image, no further information on it yet. We had a, we have, you know, a group of um, sedimentologists who are looking at this and saying, oh, I can see all these different clasts. I can see some rounded clasts. This is, this is so clearly a sedimentary rock. And then we had some igneous petrologists being like, this is so clearly a gabbro. This is so clearly, you know, slow cooled crystals from a volcanic flow. And it just, just to highlight how tricky it is to do geology on another planet with a rover, um, just telling the difference between sandstone and, you know, between sedimentary and igneous rocks can be really hard because on Mars, uh, there's no plate tectonics and there never has been. So all of your sedimentary rocks are eroded from igneous rocks. So even all the minerals are igneous minerals. Um, and we just went around and around in circles. But we, us engineers saw that and thought, hmm, look at those chunks missing out of that abraded patch. It's very crumbly Yeah, we rock. had, we had so, so then we were debating, are they chunks that crumbled out? Are they vesicles? Are they holes that were in the rock originally when it formed? We don't know. Uh, so of course that means we want to collect more data. So this is shows you how our instrument suite works together. We've got um, we've we've started out with Mass Z taking sort of the the bigger pictures from a distance from from the top of the mast. And then we had Watson on the arm taking these close-up images. We have um, we have Sherlock, which is a an instrument. It has a um, 
UV, it's UV Raman fluorescence spectroscopy. So it has a UV laser with a, a spot size of about 150 microns to measure the mineralogy, especially trying to look for organics and hydrated minerals. Um, we have PIXEL, which is um, an X-ray analysis doing elemental chemistry, also on 150 micron spot size to make uh, maps of the, the presence or absence of elements. And then we also have SuperCam, which is a, a LIBS, a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, and green Raman on the uh, on the mast that shoots basically it shoots a, a laser at the rock and looks at the color of the spark to figure out what the rock is made out of. So we put all these things together and we still were confused about this rock um, and and arguing over what it would be. And so we were like, okay, let's but let's take a sample. And so we named our sample Rubion. And uh, Kim, would you like to take over for the next couple of slides? Yeah, so uh, so this was our first sample in attempt. And um, we decided, powers that be decided that we're going to do it all in one fell swoop and one saw. We're going to drill. We're going to get the sample out of the, the rock. We're going to plug, it, plug in the arm to the, uh, you know, drill bit carousel and we're going to because there's a tube inside the um, drill bit and so we take the drill bit off we take the tube with that has the sample in it and our we have an arm inside the rover that's called the sampling handling arm the Shaw and it goes and it, it, it gets a little glove so that when it touches all this stuff it's all clean and soft and doesn't you know damage anything and so we take this uh, sample inside we put a cap on it we seal the cap but before we do that, we take images of the inside of the tube with what we call the cache cam. And then we put the top on and then we seal the top and we take more images with the cache cam so we can verify that the top was sealed. And then our SHA takes our little sample tube over and puts it in its storage place where it will wait until we drop it on the surface of Mars so that it can be returned. And so we did our first drill attempt. The images started to come down and this is what this is the first image that we got. This was the obviously sealed sample tube and we celebrated i mean we were very happy it was a very long day it was a very rough day of planning everything that could possibly go wrong had gone wrong supercam had been marked sick supercam had been marked not sun safe we only had seven and a half hours to do the planning when we at that point were usually taking 10 hours before it was timed up linked to the rover we saw this we celebrated next and then this came down this is the interior of the sample tube showing us that we had capped and stored an empty sample. There was absolutely nothing in our sample tube. So the atmospheric scientists rejoiced because they had way back before we ever launched, they had lobbied for us to take an atmospheric sample. And they were told, no, the sample tubes are too precious. We cannot do that. Bing, atmospheric sample. And so we took a long time to see where did the sample go? We uh, took Watson, we imaged inside this, the, the drill hole. There's nothing in there. We took Watson and imaged around the rover. There was no obvious sample there. So next. So um, it was unsuccessful. And because we had this really crumbly rock that was really just a paver and just, so we, we it wasn't a total loss because you see the little holes in the, uh, the, the drill. That's where we shot it with SuperCam. That's just crazy, right? That you can do that. So, um, so we decided that, well, we're not gonna let this stop us. And so after we determined that this was just a crumbly rock and by you know doing the percussive drilling and then trying to do the sample transfer at some point across along the way, we, we lost the sample in the tube or perhaps it just never entered the tube and just was that big pile above the, the hole, so. But you know, as as Kim was saying, uh, we 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 got we still got good science out of this whole attempt, even though at first we were, you know, everybody was really bummed about this, very upset. Um, we know that this rock was is crumbly, um, and we we're build we're starting to build up this picture that it had a lot of interaction with water, and that's that's why it's so crumbly. Um, we're starting to. Get this picture that we might have um, just these heavily eroded, heavily altered rocks um, that 
that might be igneous in here. So we decided that we're going to continue on and, and try drilling somewhere else and keep going. But because we have to drive back through either this area or somewhere nearby on our way back up to the landing site before heading over to the Delta, um, we sort of tuck this in our back pocket and think, okay, let's mull over whether we want to try again or not, but, um, but keep going for now. Yeah, one of the my favorite things that one of the sampling science sampling engineers said was uh, they're they're rather young and this is their first you know flight mission and and everything and and he was like well I don't understand it never did that during testing I'm like ah oh, welcome to Mars things on <laughs> Mars never act like they do on Earth and, and even when there's just no reason for it we just Mars is hard it challenges us absolutely Mars is very hard. Um, let me get my, why are you? Okay. Is this our is singing this interlude? Yeah, because either my. Oh, backwards. Some backwards. There we go. Okay. My computer. Now my computer is cooperating. All right. So we kept on driving and the rocks that we were passing changed. And of course, that means we want to stop and investigate them. Um, so we, we went to this place that we have named Citadel. Um, so right now we're, we're driving along. There's, this is a ridge of material as we're kind of skating the edge of the Seta Sand Sea. We saw this rock named Rochette and we we're like, great. This one looks like paver. another. Yeah, it's not one of those pavers. Let's... And we can see it's thick. <laughs> yes, and it, it, so it looks chunky. It looks like it's gonna hold together. Let's give this one a try. And we did. And so here is our for our abrasion called Bellegarde. And you can already see by comparison to Guillaume that this is a very different rock. Um, we don't have that patchy sort of crumbly appearance. We've got, uh, we do, we have more of a rind that you can see around the edges of the abraded patch. You can see, um, you can see some really interesting stuff inside the abraded patch. And so once again, we turned on all of our uh, all of our mineralogy and geochemistry instruments. So SuperCam uh, measured minerals consistent with igneous rock and detected that these white patches are salt. Sherlock uh, did analysis. Um, so sh inside Sherlock is both that uh, the spectrometer that I talked about, but also an additional camera that is a con uh, sort of a context image stepping between the Watson scale and the um, that, you know, sub millimeter analysis by the by Sherlock spectroscopy. And so in that in, in, in that image, we see angular and elongated crystals rather than rounded crystals. Um, so we're consistent with igneous. Uh, we also found more, we also found salt. So the yellow dots are where uh, Sherlock found calcium sulfate, and the blue dots are where Sherlock found calcium phosphate. Then Pixel uh, identified over twenty different elements here, um, but also very interestingly, uh, salt, uh, calcium sulfates, in similar areas to where Sherlock found them. So. Putting this all together, we think that the salts are telling us we have an, we have an igneous rock and water percolated through it. Um, we know on Earth when this happens, sometimes you get fluid bubbles trapped in the salt. And so there is a small chance that these salt crystals are trapping the original water that, that flowed through Jezero Crater. And we got extremely, extremely excited about this rock and said, engineers, let's do this one. And it worked. I don't know if you want to say anything else, Kim. No, no, this is so um, we were allowed to do things a little smarter the second time. And so once we actually uh, did the drilling, uh, we picked the drill up with which should have the drill bit and the sample tube and the sample inside the sample tube and took images with MassCam Z to make sure before we put it inside the rover and sealed it up that there's a sample. And so I think this came in at some ungodly time like it always does, like at 1 or 2 a.m. And when we got this image, we were then we partied. I mean, I mean, 
as much as you do sitting at home when you're working mostly <laughs> remote. But uh, yeah, we were very happy. There was lots of dancing and singing. And we liked it so much, we decided to take a second sample. Uh, so this is what Rochette.original rock looked like after sampling. We've got the two drill holes and the abraded patch. Yeah, we're just messing up all of Mars. <laughs> and uh, we have an internal chat room meme channel. And of course, everybody was so giddy. There'd been so much stress on the team because if drilling, if drilling didn't work, this mission was a failure. Well, if sample, re if there would be no sample return, the sample return mission has already started and that they would, there'd be nothing to do if we couldn't take samples. And so once we had samples in the bucket, as it were, inside the rover stored and all happy, we were very relieved. Um, and, you know, perhaps the rover herself was relieved as well. She was they, happy. She got another selfie. She got another selfie by her successful rock. Um, so. We uh, continued on to continuing to explore the crater floor. We've been continuing to sample as we go. Um, and here's our current status of we've, we've now taken our atmospheric sample uh, two on Rochette. We've taken two more at a, another location. And then we're in the process of working our way through drilling, collecting some more samples. This is where we've gone. We've so up here is where we landed, drove down. That's where Kim told you about the witness sample. Uh, down here is our is our atmospheric sample. And then we've, as we've continued along this ridge and ducked our way into SETA, we've been collecting samples as we go. Um, so what have we been learning about all of this? Well, putting uh, together what we've been seeing on the ground uh, with the rover, also some information uh, from orbit, we're seeing a variety of igneous materials. We're seeing that they are, um, we have, uh, our rocks have a lot more olivine inside the Seta. Seta rocks are more olivine rich. Uh, outside of Seta, they are more pyroxene. Um, we, our, we also saw we have a radar on the sort of the back of the, the rover. It's a ground penetrating ra radar called RIMFAX, and it's from Norway. And as we started driving into SETA, the radar um, found these, uh, these sort of ref these reflectors. That's sort of the dark. It's probably a little hard to see, but it's these dark lines that when they come up and intersect with the surface, we can actually see on our traverse that they're corresponding to some of these ridges. And so we're thinking, oh, these are, so these are layers underground that are coming up and being exposed at the surface. And then from inside, like at our, one of our farthest points in at SETA, <clears throat> Sherlock did some additional analysis on an abraded patch called GARD, discovered carbonates, olivine, um, and some organics. Now, these organic compounds are not the biological type. You know, geological processes form organics too. And we've seen these sorts of organics with the Curiosity rover at Gale Crater, which is pretty far away. So it's not, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're really excited to be able to say, yes, we have detected organics. Um, it is not, it is not a, we've detected biosignatures, but it's, it's helping us put together this picture of what are the, what was this ancient uh, environment here? Um, and really, so what we, we think is going on is that we had an igneous flow, that the, this, the floor of this crater was covered with lava, um, and that it was an, either it was a series of flows or it was a big enough flow that as it, 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 um, it developed different chemical layers within it as it cooled. Uh, and that's, so, so we're doing a lot of, the team is doing a lot of thinking and a lot of comparisons with lava flow, different lava flows under different conditions on the earth. How thick would it have to be in order to differentiate like that? Uh, is it likely that this happened, that this flow could have been that thick? How deep was the crater originally? These are all some of the questions that we are now facing into. 
Um, so this was, let's see, this is where right now the blue, there's, there's two different blue tags there. Um, one is the helicopter going back ahead to scout out um, to help us figure out, um, you know, get, get over to the Delta as we're getting ready to drive out of SETA. But before we leave this area that we're in now, we, uh, we wanted to get some last rocks to help understand what is this transition between this olivine rich environment that we're in right now and the olivine poor environment that we drove through and how are these two types of, of materials related. So we found another delicious rock to drill and we collected one core uh, perfectly and now I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Yeah, we thought that our sampling mows were at least behind us for a few months, but uh, you can see here we did one abrade patch and then we did two samples. Uh, the first sampling went perfect. We, we took the sample on one day. We did the imaging with the mass cam Z. There was rock inside the sample tube. And so we ingested the sample tube into our sampling and caching system and sealed it and stuck it away. And then we went to do the sample se second sample. Of course, this was always, as that always happens, this was right around the Christmas holidays. And so we uh, did the second sample, we picked up the drill, we took the imaging with ZCAM, and yes, there was sample inside. And then we went to store the sample by, you know, plugging in the uh, drill bit into the bit carousel. And um, we, re we hit some resistance earlier than we should have when we do that operation. And so we had a stand down, everybody looked at the data, and it seemed like the, uh, the drill was pushing against something that would not allow it to actually get far enough into the drill bit carousel for us to do the exchange. Next. So we took the, we uh, unplugged the drill and moved the arm and we used the Watson camera to image the drill bit carousel. And as you can see, some of our sample fell out onto our drill bit carousel. And so on the left is the, uh, the Watson image and on the right is a zoom in of the Watson image where you can see. And if you look really closely on the right, there are some that you can obviously see in the circular area, and those were concerning, but the ones that really concerned us are the ones underneath it. You can barely see that they've, there's some that have dropped through because they're supposed to be able to drop through and onto the ground or drop through the bit carousel itself and go onto the ground to go through the sampling system and onto the ground. Um, because we rotate the bit carousel, that's why it's called a carousel, and it can rotate either way. And we have, you know, different, it has to, you have to line up the part of the bit carousel that does what you want it to do, whether you want it to take, um, if you want to get the abrade bit back or if you want to give the uh, sample tube and the drill bit off. And so these, this was very concerning. And so we tried uh, several things. We tried to kind of rotate the bit carousel, but not too much to knock some of these off. And um, we had a stand down. We did lots of remote science until they could decide what to do. And, um, at one point we had uh, rotated the big carousel and the, the big ones on the top had fallen off, but the little ones down below were still there. And so this is where the internet makes us feel bad sometimes because the internet is like, oh my gosh, they did it, look, the rocks are gone. And we're like, no, look again, they're still there. And so we couldn't figure out exactly how to get the ones on the bottom to move. And so if you know you, you have something on your car and you want it to fall off, what would you do? We drove, we wiggled one of our, our uh, wheels and then we backed up to get a 13 degree tilt on the rover and hope that that would drop off. And next. Oh, here's a better look at the bit carousel moving and those rocks. Oh, I forgot we had this. Yeah, this is a really good look at the problematic rocks because they were just the right size, of course, to, to, to jam up the bit carousel if we moved it too much. Next. And so uh, oh, I skipped to the end of the story. But one thing we also decided to do was we have some sample left in the tube, but we don't really want to take a partial sample and we know it's crumbly. So if we try to, to put it into the rover, we could get the same thing happen again. So we littered Mars, it's what we did. And so you see the, in the blink, that we, there's the rest of our sample and it came off in little chunks. So, but now we wanna drill there again and those chunks are in our way. So then we made sure that the sample was empty. So now we have an empty, we have an empty uh, sample bit, and so now we can drive. And so we stowed the arm, we drove, we wiggled our wheel, and next. And then we got this image back where there is nothing left on our bit carousel. So um, now we have driven back to that spot to take another sample. 
But of course, now what have we done? We dropped all those rocks there. And now if we put our stabilizers to stabilize our drill bit on one of those rocks, that could be bad. So now we're having to take more imaging so that we can sample somewhere where we will not put the, the stabilizers on those rocks. So woohoo. <laughs> so it's always, always, a, always something. Um, so that, that's where we are. That's what we've done. I'm just going to play this as a, a lovely uh, sort of traveling through a, a panorama that we took um, with Masscam Z while being really one of our stationary uh, times. The, the, um, the mountains in the background are the rim of the crater, and they are more than half a mile away. Right here, we are just passing. That's where the, um, the canyon that was carved by a river. And then you see these brown cliffs, and those are that's the delta. Um, uh, you can see the sand sea of Seta in between us and that delta. Uh, and you can um, see there's some right at the base of the delta in a few places, there's some really intriguing rocks peeking out that we're hoping might be mudstones. We were, we've been, um, you know, we, we're looking for mudstones to try and sample, which are also going to be crumbly. So that's going to be a whole new adventure. Um, so this is uh, where we are going. Um, so right now we're finishing up uh, trying to understand what's going on here. These, these what we think are volcanic layers um, here on the, the crater floor. And then we are going to be, nope, there we go. Then we are going to be retracing our steps more or less on this white path and then taking this blue line uh, around, swinging around Seta and making a beeline up and onto the Delta. So uh, that's what's hopefully to come in the next year. Um, and with that, we would be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Any, any questions from the audience? Yeah, this is... Uh... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, how many sample tubes do you actually have to work with? Oh, Kim, it's like 40. Isn't it 42, like the answer to everything? I think so. It's, it's 42, and some percentage are, uh, are like spares in case of something going wrong, like as we have seen things happen. Um, and the... Um, but we are having a sort of a strategy right now. You can you may notice that we're collecting pairs of samples at a lot of these places, and that is so that um, we can, when we're going to drive up and onto that delta, we'll collect more samples along the delta. We will leave a cache. Um, we will leave a cache, sort of up there somewhere, and then we will keep going and collect more samples. So we're gonna leave half of our samples there and then keep going um, to, uh, to collect samples outside of Jezero Crater. There's some really fascinating, uh, more volcanic water interaction type uh, paleo environments to study over there. Um, so, so that way then, if anything happens to the rover while it's doing that extended mission, uh, there will still be a nice cache of rocks from inside Jezero, these fabulous rocks of the delta and the, the volcanic floor um, available for sample return. Yeah, because what we don't want to do is have that little sample handling arm die, and then we can't drop the samples out on to Mars. And so if we get a uh, cache out earlier enough, then we'll at least have something to return. Okay, so we have a uh, Miss Hand in the audience from Ninad. Hi, so uh, uh, my question was like, uh, when you fly the helicopter in the environment, uh, because of the heightened uh, carbon dioxide uh, levels, uh, did you experience any problems because the CO2 is usually heavier than the usual air, so? No, what causes problems for the, the helicopter is just the, the density of the atmosphere. And, and it's almost, you know, it's 1% of what we have here. And so they just have to spin their blades really fast. And then weather changes. So we just had a, a little miniature dust storm happen right on top of the rover. And so we actually had to cancel one of their flights because uh, 
<laughs> it was bad weather, which is hilarious. Um, and Meta has wind sensors and they measure the wind and uh, the helicopter folks get that data every day. And so they look at that. They're more worried about the wind than the carbon dioxide. And, and then, oh, and as we get into summer, now the atmosphere is even thinner. So we start out spinning the blades at I think 2400 RPM and I think we're up to 28 or 2900 RPM now. One, yeah, one of the weird things uh, in, a, in a fascinating way uh, about Mars is that so um, a third of its atmosphere condenses out as, uh, as ice at whichever pole is in winter. So you've got a third of the atmosphere goes into dry ice at the northern pole, and then uh, when it's no, when it's northern spring, that uh, sublimates back up into the atmosphere, travels down to the southern pole, and condenses out down there. So you get these huge swings in surface pressure, and huge being relative because it is, you know, a tiny percentage of the Earth uh, atmospheric pressure, um, and that's. We never, I think we never expected the helicopter to last this long. So they didn't have, they didn't do the, the testing uh, of the helicopter under all those different atmospheric conditions. Well, yeah, the helicopter was only supposed to go, I think what, 15 feet uh, up maximum and stay in the air for 90 seconds maximum. And let's see, I, I had it written down here. Yeah, so we have flown up to 40 feet high and the maximum flight time was 166.4 seconds and the maximum uh, distance she's gone is 625 meters. So she's doing more than they ever thought she could. And they really were afraid that when we first dropped her off that she might not even survive the night because it's so cold on Mars. And she's a lot of commercial off the shelf parts on that, that little helicopter. And so they were worried about that, but she's, she's come through with flying colors. Okay, we have a couple of comments or questions. Um, first, could you talk about the colors of the rocks in that last image and that I assume the, I don't know if they meant the video. panorama? The video? Um, let's, awesome. here, let's, let's just watch that again because it's so cool. Um, so this, the, this image is uh, adjusted color. It's enhanced color. Um, so if you were actually on Mars, like when, before we do the enhanced color, the sky is pink and everything has this pink haze to it. Um, so we enhance the color and adjust the sky back to blue so that it, it helps the science team sort of apply geological experience and intuition to the analysis. Um, so, so that's part of why the, the colors look kind of intense. Um, so yeah, this dark stuff really close here, those are the volcanic rocks um, from Citadel and, and, um, and you can see the dark sand sea out there from Seta. The lighter brown, let me just hit, let me just go back here. These, these brown uh, deposits that you can, you can see some cross bedding from here. These are, this one is a, we think an eroded remnant from the Delta. Um, we've got the dark sand. Uh, this is the, the catching just the edge of the Delta. Um, and then the, so, so we think that those are, those are likely going to be mudstones and sandstones. Um, we've seen some boulders from a distance. So we're really excited about getting up and, and untangling the story of the Delta from, from what we've seen, even from this distance where it's quite a ways away. Um, the, we can tell that it's more complicated than just we had a lake and a river flowing into it. It looks like we probably had some, uh, some floods washing in from the crater rim to bring boulders down and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, there was a question, what are the organic types one through three and how do they compare to the bioorganics? That is where I am outside my area of expertise. Uh, the, um, that actual, though that's, those slides were from um, a, recent presentation at, there, I think we did a press conference and there was a fall EGU 
uh, abstract from the Sherlock team. Uh, we are uh, the, the various, all the science team is now working on our first round of, of papers to come out. So hopefully in the next, well, you know how long it takes research papers to get through, but um, the in the next six months, hopefully fingers crossed, uh, we will have our first real big wave of papers with these results. And so there'll be more information in there. You can also check out um, on the website, the public website, but it doesn't really go into much detail there, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm on the Sherlock team. As I'm, uh, they're obsolete, but uh, so I don't understand all their science, but I know they're working on the paper. So it's in the rounds of revisions right now. Okay. Um, do you have, um, from the UAS seminar class, uh, do you have any results to show from your gamma ray spectrometer? We do not actually have a gamma ray spectrometer. Um, there is gamma ray spectrometer data from Mars, but that is taken from orbit. Um, I am not sure if any of the other rover, let's see, Curiosity doesn't have gamma ray. I am not sure if the upcoming ExoMars mission has one or not. Yeah, and obviously, sure. you know, Spirit and Opportunity didn't either. They have yeah. their alpha, alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. Sure. Two two questions about the weather. Um, one was what what sort of wind velocities do you detect on detect on the surface, and how does solar power generation on Mars compare to Earth? Are are any of them solar powered? I don't think any of them are. Uh, the helicopter uh, solar powered. Oh right, yeah. And Spirit and Opportunity were solar powered. And some of our landers Insight and Phoenix have been solar powered, but um, our big rovers, you can see on that those fins on the back of the rover, that is our um, MMRTG. We are powered, we are nuclear powered. Uh, I'm just trying to go back to that weather. Um, so it looks like they are not reporting the winds on here. I know that um again there there's they had a lot uh, this is the first time this is the the wind sensor was a relatively new kind of sensor and i think it might be taking them extra long to calibrate it um and be confident in the calibration to share it outside of the team you know they pass things on to the helicopter team um with all the caveats that we're still working out what the data is actually telling us. Um, so I don't have an answer for that, unfortunately. But again, um, I, I know that they just had a paper accepted. <laughs> so uh, again, those results should hopefully be coming soon. They also have a humidity sensor as well. Great. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, the, the helicopter is, is solar powered. Um, Kim, do you yeah, know if how long? It takes well, to charge up for flight. Mm, no, I know that they they get a lot of power from their little bitty. Uh, they, it's 425 millimeters by 165 millimeters, and it charges six lith six lithium ion batteries. So, um, and the good That's thing about it is the problem that we have on Mars with solar panels is that they get dusty. As you can see, the picture of the helicopter on the left, her solar panel is a little bit dusty. But the great thing about the helicopter is when she flies, it cleans off her solar panels. And when uh, Opportunity and Spirit were driving around, dust devils would come by and clean off their solar panels. And so that's why Opportunity was able to last about 15 years. Um, so, and the, and the battery is, is the thing too for, uh, opportunity. I mean, how many people have a battery that you recharge over and over and it lasts 15 years? That was just crazy because she had a she had a heater stuck on that was continually draining the battery. So uh, what's bad for batteries, all of us do this with our phones, I think, is we keep our battery charged up as much as we can. And batteries don't like being at maximum charge all the time. And so opportunity was constantly draining her battery and recharging it. And so they feel like that's one of the reasons she got 15 years out of that battery. And uh, the only reason that we lost her is because there was a global wide dust storm. And when there's a global wide dust storm, no, no sunlight hits the, the Martian surface. And if you're a solar powered vehicle and you go a month without any sun, you're, you're pretty much toast. But I don't know how they compare with uh, 
the uh, what we get on on Earth on in solar panels. The thing on Earth is if your solar solar panel is dirty, you can go clean it, and there we can't. We have to hope for, you know, very happy dust devils to come clean us off, or the helicopter can clean herself off by flying. We had uh, two final questions about the geology, um, about the cross bedding layers from the panoramic. Are you planning on investigating those cross bedding layers, maybe getting closer to them? And also regarding the delta, do you have any estimates of the thickness of the delta? Uh, let me just check if I have the thickness of the delta in the my reference notes here. Because uh, it looks huge. I know the the crater rim is around 600 meters high. Um, so, I mean, you can kind of let me go back to the panorama. Just scroll, scroll, scroll. Uh, you can kind of get a bit of sense. Let's see. Um, I'm sure that the information is on the public website. I do not have it at my fingertips. Um, we are debating, so this feature here is called Kodiak, where you see these really obvious cross bedding. Um, and then there's, there's more cross bedding, but the, the angle and the lighting makes it not quite as obvious and spectacular to see in, um, let's see if it comes around again, up in some of these portions of the, um, over here, there we go, of the delta. Uh, and so we are actively planning, so, so then from orbit, this, this, this is Kodiak right there. So we are debating whether it's worth taking the time to drop down there and, and, and study those uh, layers, or are we going to get some really good exposures as we come around here? Um, so we know that there's good exposures sort of up. Hopefully you can see my mouse and all the things I'm gesturing at. Um, uh, no. no? Okay. So the, um, the, the knob, so sort of if you go just left from the, the turquoise dot, across Seta and then there is a bright blob and that is Kodiak. Uh, so we know that there's good cross bedding there, but we're not sure how close up to it we can get. Um, it might just be that we can we get because there's a lot of loose scree at the, the on the slope. We can't drive up it. We could drive closer and look up and maybe get you know better measurements from our, our cameras and um, you know, get some remote sensing data on it from, from closer. Um, but I don't think we're going to, we're not really going to be able to get up into it and, and touch those layers. As we swing along that blue trail, as we get around the corner of Seta, the rest of the delta is going to really come into view a lot better. And we'll be able to see more of what, what is exposed there. We think that um, we should be able to see some spectacular layers there as well. So um, I think it's, it's, we haven't made a decision yet. Um, the the not sort of nominal path that we're planning on going, the strategic, like that we planned strategically, uh, most efficient path is to follow that blue one. But um, as, we, as we start that journey, there will definitely be, there definitely are already members of the science team saying, hey, maybe we should stop by Kodiak as well. We did look at trying to drive directly from where we are right now over to Kodiak, and we can't make it. There's, it's the terrain. We're through that sand sea, and and other, other just terrible terrain. It gave the rover planners nightmares. So yes, it would not end that. well for us. Great. So we had just one final comment. Someone said, "I will never again complain about having a difficult site to drill." <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't see any other questions. Any final quick questions from the audience? I don't see anything yet. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll say thanks again very much, Kim and Sarah. It was an awesome presentation. Um, thanks, thanks for having for, us. Yeah, thanks for joining Absolutely. us. And um, 
for everyone else, we'll uh, see you next week. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah.